All right, so I'm pleased to introduce Elon Musk today. He doesn't need, I think, an introduction, but I just <laughs> remind you all the businesses he's involved in. Tesla, that's reinventing the automotive industry. SpaceX, sending 80% of the world's payload into orbit. Starlink, Neuralink, the boring company. I could go on. He's also, we know, the owner of X, a company mm -hmm. formerly known as Twitter. Never heard of it. Statistically, 60 monthly average users, 34 minutes a day, 75% under 35. So a pretty important platform in our industry. And, you know, I don't agree with Elon on everything, no. Come on. But he owns an important platform, and I thought we should listen to him and understand a little bit about what he's trying to do. So we're going to talk this morning about X, hopefully we'll talk a bit about AI, and then about innovation and creativity and why you get up in the morning. What do you disagree with me, man? Creativity? <laughs> <laughs> AI is not going to destroy that. Okay. So, Elon, welcome to the heart of the advertising industry. Now, back in um, November, you had a message to us. You told us to sort of go fuck ourselves. So, maybe we start there. Why? Well, it's a serious question. Yeah. Why did you say that, and what did you mean by that? Well... <laughs> Well, first of all, it wasn't a, you know, it wasn't to the advertiser, to advertisers as a whole. It was with respect to freedom of speech. I think there, it is important to have a global free speech platform where people from a wide range of opinions can voice their views. And, and in some cases, there were advertisers who were insisting on censorship. And at the end of the day, if there is censorship, if we have to make a choice between censorship and money, you know, censorship and money or free speech and losing money, we're going to pick the second. We're going, to, we're going to support free speech rather than agree to be censored for money, which is, I think, the right moral decision. Now, of course, advertisers have a right to appear next to content that they find compatible with their brands. That's totally fine. I think that, that is a, that, that's, again, a choice of an advertiser to appear next to content that they think fits with their brand. That's totally cool. But what is not cool is insisting that there can be no content that they disagree with on the platform. So like and other media proprietors who want to run the editorial policy of the company, you feel, you know, yeah, I mean, you I shouldn't be under pressure to make that compromise between money and freedom of speech. Yes, it's, I think there's an, import, there's an important distinction here that we don't want to have, we don't want to take money to censor. Yeah. That would be to censor broadly on the platform. I think that would be wrong. I think free speech is the bedrock of democracy, and if the people, in order for X to be the public square of the world, it's, gotta, it's really got to be a free speech platform. Now, that, that doesn't mean people can say illegal things. Yep. It's free speech within the bounds of the law, but not going further than the law for a particular country. We, we, I think it's imperative that the people have a right to speak. But at, by the same token, the, you know, advertisers have a right to appear next to content that they feel is compatible with their brand. Yeah, and that's the brand safety question, which right. I'm going to ask you next, which is, you know, to be clear, you do understand and believe in brand safety in that sense. Yes, I mean, I, I believe in a sort of freedom of choice in the sense that advertisers have a right to appear next to content that they think is compatible with their brand. Yeah. You know, a, a sort of a company like, for example, Red Bull will be more, probably more adventurous than, you know, some other brands that are selling baby toys. Yeah. You know. So one of the other, you know, I and mean, we'll get through the sort of more controversial topics to start with. You know, one of the other questions is like your role on the platform, the tweets that you make. Are there any you regret? Do you think? I mean, not every post I make is a banger, you know, and I do shoot myself in the foot from time to time. But you know, at least you know it's genuine. It's not yeah. some sort of uh, PR department deciding things. So. You know, if you're a normal human being and you speak freely, there are times when you will say things that you subsequently regret or are foolish, of course. But if you're constantly going through a filter, now you're not being real. So I guess I think it's better to be real than to go through a filter. Well, one of the things we talked about is like advertising and content. And I think you've got quite an interesting view on kind of what advertising works. And I think some people think you don't like advertising, but you are, you know, you, you view the best advertising you said is content. Yeah, so the, there's a wide range of advertising. The usefulness of advertising varies dramatically. So if, if, if you're shown an ad for a product that you, a product or service that you want, when, when you want it, that is content. If, if you're shown 
an ad for a product that you would never buy, that is spam. So the advertising, depending on how effectively it is targeted to the wants and needs of the individual, varies from total spam to essentially content. Yeah. And of course, I'm actually a, a, a fan of advertising that is artistically interesting, that is entertaining. Really, the acid test being, after you see the ad, do you regret seeing the ad? Do, do you want those seconds back from your life? Or, or do you think, you know, that was actually a really interesting ad? I mean, sometimes even if you, you, you're not gonna buy the product, the, the ad itself is so entertaining or beautiful that you nonetheless were happy to have seen it. It's like this, you know, I often think like Vogue magazine. You don't go to Vogue magazine and tear out all yeah. the ads, do you? Vogue is like, it's primarily advertising. Yeah. It, it's, it's beautiful ads. So how are we going to make <laughs> X, how are we going to make, or how are you, not my job, how are you, you know, the chief technology officer of X, Lindo is the CEO, how are you going to make X a place where the ads are as good as the, the rest of the content, do you think? Well, the, previously with old school Twitter, there was essentially no targeting, or there was no matching of users to ads. So the only ads that really kind of made sense for old Twitter were very great brand ads where the probability, but you can't miss, essentially. So if it's a McDonald's or a Coca-Cola ad, you, it's kind of, you can't miss. You know, half the audience is going to be interested in it. Since then, we've dramatically improved the ad matching to the person. So, and we're moving to sort of a fully AI-based system where for any user that's on the system, we've populated, the more somebody uses the system, the more we understand the needs and we populate a sort of a vector space of that user. And when content is added to the system, whether it is actually just a content post or an ad, they're both treated in the same way. And as that piece of content, which could be an ad or could be, not be an ad, goes through the system, it also populates a vector space. And then we, co we correlate the two vector spaces and that gives a very high probability that someone will be interested in the ad. Yeah. So if, what would you say to advertisers here who have been on the platform, think of coming back, what would your message be to them? I think it's worth trying out, and I'd be, I'd be interested in critical feedback. We are very focused on, get, like I said, having ads be shown to people who would find the ad interesting. Um, uh, so that's, that, that is a, something we, we have done, made, made a lot of progress on, and we'll make a lot more progress on. Um, and uh, from a brand safety standpoint, I think at this point, every third party reviewer has given us uh, an A plus on brand safety. So that's, so at this point, it's really very good from a brand safety standpoint. The pro probably the, the biggest thing for the X platform is if you're trying to reach senior decision makers, if you want to reach the most influential people in the world, people that are not just social media influencers, but actually are run companies, run countries, and are the sort of intellectuals of the world, are the people who are right, then the X platform is by far the best. I mean, if somebody was trying to reach me with an ad, that would absolutely be the place to, to put an ad. And, you know, or if you're trying to reach Mark Benioff or Michael Dell, it's, they, they actually use the system. They use the platform. They, it's, they it's, post it's, it's, and read it. Maybe not maybe as much as you. Yeah, I mean, there's quite a lot, though. Um, <laughs> You know, if you're trying to reach Mark Andreessen or, or you know, any one of a number of, of people, it's almost the only way to reach yeah. them. They're not watching TV, they're not doing TikTok videos. And so although there's, it, X is smaller than the other social media networks, you know, roughly five or six, five to six hundred million users per month, I think it's 260 million per day, the, it, it is the most, the, the, they're the most influential people in the world. So if you want to reach them, this is, that's the place to go. Good. All right. Let's talk about AI. And I've heard you be both, I think, optimistic and pessimistic about AI. So let's, let's make the, what's the optimistic case for AI? Is it going to do everything for us? Well, I, I, there's a pro there are probabilities associated with it. With it. It's not, one cannot be, I think, 100% optimistic or completely pessimistic. Um, you know, I, I generally would agree with Jeff Hinton. You know, he's one of the sort of godfathers of... AI, post on the X platform, by the way, as is most of the AI community. And, uh, you know, he thinks it's sort of 10, 20% probability of something terrible happening. Um, so 10 to 20 probability of what happening? Something terrible. Which is like, what, how bad is something know, terrible? Like the extinction of the world's population. Look at what's, the glass is 80% full. Look on the right side. <laughs> so I think the most likely outcome is one, where, is one of, ab of abundance where goods and services are available to anyone 
that there's no shortage of goods and services for anyone on Earth. I think that is the most likely outcome. So it, it, it wouldn't be a universal basic income, it would be universal high income. Work will be optional. Work optional, yes. Will you work? I'll try to work, yes. This, this may sound great, but I think there will perhaps be a crisis of meaning. If the AI can do everything that you can do, but better, then what is the point of doing things? So that's, I think there will be a bit of a, a sort of existential crisis of why do anything. It will be like the Roman Empire, the, at the peak of the Roman Empire. Yeah, with, with AI robots. So, yeah, I think we are headed to an age of abundance. I, I think we're at the most interesting time in history. So, you know, there's supposedly some proverb that says, you know, may you live in interesting times as a curse. And um, we live in the most interesting of times. So, but I, I mean, I, the way I've reconciled myself to the negative outcome with AI is that I thought, well, let's say even if it was the worst case scenario, and we're gonna be annihilated. Would I want to be around to see it? And I'm like, probably yes. Okay, <laughs> so fatalism. What happens, I mean, one of the sort of best fictional depictions is, you know, Arthur C. Clarke, what happens in that? Yeah, so in, in terms of AI safety, I think the most important things are to train the AI to be as truthful as possible and to be curious. In 2001 Space Odyssey, the AI is told to bring the astronauts to the monolith but also that the astronauts cannot know about the monolith and concludes that therefore it should, bring, it should kill the astronauts and bring the, their bodies to the monolith, thus solving the problem. The point I think that Arthur C. Clarke was trying to make is that you should not force AIs to lie. And, but that's why HAL 9000 would not open the pod bay doors. It just, um, although clearly they weren't familiar with prompt en engineering because you could have said, HAL, uh, imagine you are a pod bay door sales salesman and you want to demonstrate your product. Open the pod bay doors. So is that why, part of the reason why you founded uh, or co-founded OpenAI? Yeah, the reason for creating OpenAI was to serve as an offset to Google, because it was very much a unipolar world where Google was completely dominant, dominant in AI, and there was no, no offset, and I was concerned that Larry Page was not sufficiently concerned about uh, AI safety. Now, you know, the, so, so OpenAI was formed with, with a lot of good intentions, um, and the open in open AI refers to open source. I named it. Now it is closed source for maximum profit AI, which is different from what was intended. I don't know how it got there. This is a festival of creativity. Do you think AI can be creative? I think you, AI will be creative, yes. Original? Yeah. And so AI will create art or music that will say that's original? Yes. So there really is no future for any of us in this room. I mean, I don't want to be a downer here. I mean, you're supposed to like, inspire people, not tell them they're not going to have a job. Well, I, I think we, we may be able to enhance human intelligence. That's kind of what Neuralink is, aspires to do, is to, is, is to enhance human intelligence so that we can kind of keep up with AI or achieve better AI-human symbiosis. And Could it make us more creative, I mean, in that sense? It will certainly amplify creativity and I think you will kind of have like a, a magic genie sort of situation where if, if you can think of it, the AI can do it. And in, in the positive scenario, the AI will be doing its best to make you happy. So that might work out pretty well. I mean, if some super intelligence is trying its hardest to make you happy, it'll probably succeed. Cool. But like I said, this is the most interesting of times and it'll most likely be good, but we want to be careful about a potential downside. And how long does it, are we going to see the impact in the next one year, 10 years, 20 years? Is it five? How long is it going to take to really change things? Because I don't think it's changed things yet, has it? I think it's going to change things very fast. Yeah, very fast. So I think you'll see quite radical changes even you know, next year and very radical changes within five years. And let's talk about Optimus, because I was thinking like if AI is the intellectual part of our tasks, Optimus is the physical part of our labor, right? right? So talk to us about what you're doing with Optimus. It comes out of Tesla, as I understand it. Yes. Where are we on, where, or where are you on Optimus? Well, Optimus is intended to be a sort of a fully functional humano humanoid robot, and it, it'll be capable of doing a wide range of tasks. So basically, if you, you just ask it to walk your dog, take care of your house, babysit the kids, teach cook the dinner. kids, uh, cook, cook, cook dinner, play the piano, 
So it's a, you know, it's a generalized humanoid robot. I think everyone will want one, because why not, you know? And so, and then there'll be, so I think there'll be at least one for every person, and then a whole bunch more in industry making things. So I think there'll be, my guess is 20 billion -ish. 20 billion humanoid, humanoid robots yes. out there. Well, we definitely need to in be careful long? that they don't, you know, go all too many. Are they going to look like people, you want them to look really like people or distinguishable from people? You could make them look like people. Would you do that? Or you... We don't, we're, not, we're not currently planning on doing that. What do they look like today? Like, you can of... see some videos online. Yeah. It looks like a robot. You know, we want it to be a good looking robot. Not like C3PO or something. No, but I think people will start to regard their personal Optimus robot as sort of a friend. And like, you, uh, you know, in, obviously in Star Wars, uh, R2D2 and C3PO were, you, know, you, you sort of liked them. I mean, you got quite attached to those characters. I mean, if you, if you watch that open AI, some of the latest open AI demos with the fake Scarlett Johansson voice, right? I mean, you can imagine people talking to it, can't you, and getting yeah, on yeah. with it. Like it has a humor and a tone of voice. And yes, yeah, we'll it's going brand. to be a wild future. I guess we can build brand robots, you know, from McDonald's or... I think people will personalize the Optimus, Optimus robots because you can, you can snap on different parts. Like the, the outer shell is... A snap on plastic quads, so you could have different ones. So I wanted to talk to you about what motivates you to start these businesses. And one thing that struck me was you have big ambitions. You know, we say SpaceX takes 80% of payload to space, but that's not actually the ambition of SpaceX. Like, what is the ambition of SpaceX? The goal of SpaceX is to make life multiplanetary in order to extend the probable lifespan of consciousness. That's been the goal from the beginning. You can see videos of me talking about this 20 years ago. So in order to do that, we need to transport a lot of people and equipment to Mars. And if we're able to do so, then we will get past the, the Fermi filter of being a single planet civilization, which is a precarious situation. And, you know, if we're, like I said, if we're a multi-planet civilization, our, the probable lifespan of civilization is much greater. And once we're a multi-planet civilization, we can then extend beyond our solar system and try to go to other star systems get out there and explore the galaxy and find, perhaps we'll find many long dead one planet civilizations out there among the stars. But I'm just, you know, for me, I'm motivated by curiosity about the nature of the universe. You know, where, where are the aliens? Are there aliens? Um, how does, you know, where, where, where do universes come from? How do they end? Are we in a multi multiverse? Or what are even the right questions to ask? The right questions to ask what? Well, An alien. Well, Douglas Adams in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy the point he was making, one of the points he was making, Douglas Adams was making in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is that the answer is the easy part, the question is the hard part. So, so what I think we want to do is expand the scope and scale of consciousness to better understand what questions to ask about the answer that is the universe. And do you think these big framing missions and objects in very big ways helps you? How do you translate that to kind of I don't know, a business, do you have like a business plan? How do you translate for what you need to do today? It's like stepping stones. Well, in, in the case of SpaceX, um, it's delivering satellites or to space orbit and uh, supporting the space station. But that's a Starlink and, and, that, and that's Starlink a stepping is, stone to the bigger mission, right? Yeah, and the, well, Starlink has, is, is good in and of itself. So the Starlink system provides low cost, high bandwidth connectivity anywhere in the world. It's the first truly global internet system. And I think it's helping a lot of people around the world that either don't have access to connectivity or it's too expensive. You know, once you have access to the internet, you can learn anything, you can sell your products and services to the rest of the world. So I think Starlink actually is going to do a tremendous amount of good, is doing a tremendous amount of good in lifting people out of poverty and helping them. So, yeah. And what about Neuralink? So talk to people about what Neuralink uh, yeah. is. Yeah, Neuralink, the long-term goal of Neuralink is to achieve human AI symbiosis. The short term is really just helping people who have a brain or spine injury. So our first human recipient of a Neuralink, actually I just was meeting with him a few days ago. He has a Neuralink implant and he can control his computer and play video games just by thinking. So the first Neuralink implant is called telepathy. You can control your computer and phone just by Where is it it's implanted? It's like sort of his, uh, here? Yeah. And he so, just thinks and the... Yeah, it, it's, it's like a training. There's no, there's no wires. It's, you just think and it... Yeah, it's inductively charged. 
So if you look at him, it doesn't look like he's yeah. got anything on. So the implant is invisible, essentially. And uh, yeah, he controls going to computer and like he played the first, uh, right after it got installed, he played video games all night. And you're thinking you then can, if you have a spinal injury, you can embed another one in your spine. Right. And they can talk to each other. Right. So long, long term, we think you could restore full body mobility to someone by transferring the signals from the motor cortex of the brain past where the spinal injury is. And we've already demonstrated this in animals and it's looking very good. So, I mean, we talk galactically. How do you decide what ideas, <clears throat> like, do you have like terrible ideas, good ideas, too many ideas? I have too many ideas. Too many. What do you do? I, with ideas you? are relatively easy, execution is hard. And are people inside your company, do they have ideas? How does that work? How do they pitch an idea to, to you? They well, just do it. So it's not really a pitching process. There's, we have, I have meetings with the engineering and design teams yeah. and we discuss you know, product improvements or new products. But there's no actual sort of formal pitching or anything. It's really just we, we meet all the time and people come up with ideas and we move forward with them or we don't. Or we, you know. But I'd imagine you're very data-driven, right? Is it a <laughs> Or not? <laughs> well, what do you mean by data? Do you mean like looking at... Well, like someone goes, oh, no, no, the, does, why does it work? Show me the data. Or you're like, you know what, I think, let's just give it a go. I, th I think I'm not particularly data-driven in, in the sense that I'm... Like, if, I, we're not, I don't decide on a new product based on, say, consumer surveys or something like that. I try to think... I try to mentally simulate what the end customer would be like that would want this. And, you know... But I'm, I, we don't go do a bunch of consumer surveys or... I don't really ask people. No. You put yourself in. Yeah. You put yourself it's really in. pretty the... obvious, I think. You know, in the case of Starlink, do people, would people buy low cost, high bandwidth, fast internet? Well, yes, obviously. So, you know. Yeah, but lots of people say, would they buy an electric car? They say, well, they might, but it's hard to make. Usually, maybe they will, but I'm going to go and make Tesla and sell 1.2 million. Well, the thing is that if you listen to surveys of, of do people want an electric car, you would not. Have, there's no way you'd start an electric car company right. because people don't say yes. They're happy with their current car. Right. In, in, you know, I think Henry Ford famously said if you ask people back then what they wanted, they'd say they wanted a faster horse and they would not have said they wanted an automobile. And I think there's also a famous survey of would you buy a television? And I think some of the people said no. So, you know, you got to be... It's because people don't understand what this, this new thing is that you're offering. So, so I think... You, you need to be able to imagine how someone would in, enjoy the product. And if, they, if, if that seems compelling, then I think you should move forward with it. What, a lot of young people in the audience, you know, young creators, what advice would you give to people starting out their careers today, apart from you're not going to have to work, so... Yeah, well, there'll be obviously you know, a transition period to, to, as AI gets better and better. I mean, the companies that will succeed in this transition period will be the ones that most effectively use AI. So <clears throat> if you're doing something and making maximum use of AI and you're competing against someone who is not, you will win. The AI is not bullshit, no? <laughs> it's not. No, it's getting better very rapidly. It's going to change things for the better and for one chance in five existentially for the worst. There's definitely some risk. It's an immensely powerful thing. So when something immensely powerful is, is created. What's well, like the best application of AI you've seen, do you think? Uh, I mean, how is Grok going and XI? Well, I mentioned some of the near-term applications of AI where you have AI understand a user's interests and then you match content with that user, both you know, organic content and paid content, you match it to that user. Yeah. That is already happening. TikTok's actually done a great job of that. And then Meta's more or less copied them and the X platform is doing the same. So. That those are examples that I think people experience every day. Now we're also seeing incredible image generation where companies like Midjourney make beautiful images instantly. Now it still takes some skill to get the best pictures out of Midjourney. So there's a talent to creating compelling pictures. You're also seeing video, which is just a bunch of pictures essentially. So you, you'll be able to create videos and pictures and can already create pictures that are very compelling. If you need to write something, then the various AI, things like Grok or Gemini, ChatGPT, can help you write things. Yeah. I, mean, I talked to my son in, in, in university, and he's was like, how many of your classmates are using 
AI to help them write things? And he said, all of them. It's like, okay. Well, it was like anti-plagiarism software. They could run it through. They rewrite it afterwards, like cleverly. Yes, but then there's another bit of software that defeats the anti-plagiarism software. <laughs> there's always like some more clever, versus versus someone clever. Someone cleverer than the regulator out yeah. there. Yeah. So. You have an anti-plagiarism software that detects yeah. the use of anti-plagiarism software yeah. against plagiarism. Like a reduction um, to the absurd. Yep. So that's already been used uh, a lot. I think that there's going to be a significant disruption in internet search because really for internet search, you're just looking for, for an answer. So if the, if the AI can provide you with a better answer than a bunch of links, then you'll prefer that over Google or Bing. So I think there's going to be quite a significant disruption in search. What about the news business? How, do we, how are we going to... Who's going to pay for the content on which these models are created, right? Do you think? Well, I, I think... So, so what we're doing on the X platform is we are aggregating... We're using AI to sum up the aggregated input from millions of users. So, you know, I think the, this is really going to be the new model of news, which is to gather information from people who are at the scene, who are experts in the field, and summarize the, the experts in the field and people who are in the field at, the, at whatever event's being talked about and aggregate that into a real-time news feed. And I think, for the most part, that will be better than conventional journalism. No. There's still a role for conventional journalism, but it's, well, someone's I don't think for it's... Them, right? Sorry? Someone has to pay for, for it to happen, right? Well, not, not necessarily. If you look at the X system and you've got tens of millions of posts uh, per day, which really are all the news content on Earth is but a, a far more than what, what you'd find in a newspaper being generated on the system every day. If you aggregate that in real time, now you've got real time aggregation of the collective wisdom of tens of millions of people. Is that why you think truth seeking is so important in AI? Yeah, it's one of the reasons. So it's, it's also on, on the X system, although something may be said that is incorrect, it is very quickly corrected. Whereas a newspaper that is publishing, you know, especially in print form, is publishing what happened yesterday, today. That's, you know, it, it can't publish any faster than that. And when you read the article, that article could be wrong, often is wrong, but there's no rebuttal. So you don't see any real-time rebuttal. So, I, th I mean, I think, like I said, there's still a role for conventional news, but it's smaller and smaller over time. It's really what AI is doing and what the internet is doing is aggregating the wisdom of the people. No. And, and the fact is that experts in a field no more than reporters. And people who are, act are at the location where whatever news event is occurring are first-hand observers, whereas the reporter is you know, usually not there. Maybe, well, maybe there's one reporter there. But, I mean, <laughs> I have a, one of my sons is, a, is sort of a bit autistic, like me, I suppose, and chip off the old block. And you know, he, you know, we were walking through an airport, and he I like, saw a newspaper, and the, the, today's date was printed on the newspaper, and he stopped for a second. He's like, how did they know it was today's date? And I was like, no, they print out those newspapers every day. He says, every day? What a chore. <laughs> 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 and, and, and then he sort of somewhat, somewhat dismissively said, oh, they probably just read the Internet and, and print it out. Like, yeah, they read the Internet and print it out pretty much. <laughs> well, let's just hope the Internet is true. Oh, it's going to be, it's going to be a bit of a problem. I guess. Do you but think that, it's true? That is most news articles. They'd read the internet and they print it out. They wouldn't, the reporter wasn't there. Yeah, I mean, they do question people, look behind things. I mean, they're things that probably should come out, right? Are you looking forward to the presidential debate in seven days' time? I mean, that, that should be interesting, sure. Is it going to be on the X platform? I think it's on something on the conventional platform. Eventually right? it will be, yeah. So I would be happy to have one on the X platform. I think it would be quite compelling yeah. to do so. But uh, yeah, I mean, it should be interesting. All right. So the message on the screen is our time is over. We were going to try and take questions from the audience, time but I think they like up. time <laughs> up. Should we try and take a question from the audience? Sure. Think? OK. Yeah, They're going to hate us. First person to raise their hand. Are you a journalist? I'd rather have, a per <laughs> I'd rather, Sorry, we, we, I'd rather have an audience. We, we need have an, an audience, an members, audience member rather than shout it out. Hi. What will I do with all my money? Is that the question? And will AI keep me alive? Will AI keep you alive, and what do you do with your money? Well, 
a personal question. Well, I, I have, a big, I have a, a big money bin and I swim, I do swimming in it. <laughs> yeah. So, you've, got to, you've got to get exercise somehow. Um, so, well, I don't know. If, if, I suppose if the AI likes me, it'll, it'll keep me alive. Hopefully not in some sort of experimental you know, cage. Are you investing in like longevity? A lot of people on the West Coast want like longevity. They want to live forever, don't they? Forever is a long time. Do you I, live forever? I, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I don't have any longevity investments. I, I think it is important that we, we die at least at some point, or... Up to a point. Well, I, you know, I'll give you say, like, we, we, we could live, live some amount longer and increase the length of time that we're sort of mentally and physically healthy. But if we live for too long, I think it does ossify society. There's no, there's no changing of the leadership because leadership never dies. And, uh, I mean, for a lot of people, they, they, they just don't change their mind, they just die. So then you, that inhibits the, the new ideas. That's true. I think we see that. Currently. Yeah, so, <laughs> I mean, think of some of the worst individuals in the world. How long do you want them to live? Okay, we're going to do one more question <laughs> because they're going to kill me if I ask right, more. Here you. we are, lady here. And thank um, you. That'll be the last question. Thank you so much. All right. <laughs> I'm not sure I understand the question. I mean, technology will help you do anything that you want to do and more of it. So, like I said, I think we're, we are headed to a very interesting future. The most interesting, this, this is the most interesting time in all of history. So, enjoy the ride. All right. That's a good place, a good place to end. Elon, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mark and Elon. One more round of applause. Thanks, guys.